Buenos días, chicos y chicas. Eso es mío, Agostino Zinga, and this is another episode of the Agostino Zinga Show, episodio number numero 204, right? 204. As you can see, I am uh, polishing up my Spanish for no particular reason. I'm not going anywhere near Spain in the next couple of weeks. I'm actually going to Paris, which is the complete opposite of Spain. But regardless of that, how you doing? How you feeling, ladies and gentlemen? Great, happy to hear it. It's Wednesday morning somewhere in East London. The sky is very uh, cloudy right now. It looks like it might rain later on, which is perfect for me because I'm going to go running later. So I guess I'm going to go hit. I'm going to get hit by a thunderstorm or by some sort of wet storm out there, which is perfectly fine. It's the nature of the beast. But apart from that, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fresh. As you can tell how good and fresh I'm feeling because I'm wearing a white long sleeve top. And if you know anything about me, you know I don't wear anything that's white. But today I feel like, you know, I'm on my real life, you know, diddy shit. I'm on my real life, you know, Nigerian uncle shit. You know what I mean? Wearing my all white blazer, all white trousers. I got them snakeskin white boots on. You know what I mean? I'm ready to roll, right? I'm going to get a couple Stella Artois down me and start dancing. And then hopefully won't hit my wife when I get back home, right? None, none of that. We don't want any of that. No physical violence against women. We want to get aggressive with our lads at the parties. And that's where the aggression ends, right? Or starts and ends. But apart from that, I'm feeling good. I like this white top. I feel on camera it looks pretty good. I, I might start wearing brighter or lighter colors on camera. If you listen via audio, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I might as well just be stone cold naked for all you care. And actually picture that. Picture me naked, right? I know. It makes you vomit a little bit in your mouth. But just picture it. Let that thought marinate in your head a little bit. Mm? Got it? Great. Nice. Now imagine me ashy and naked. Let that soak in a little bit. Cool. Got it? Nice. Got it. <laughs> I'm sure someone's done that already, right? Has someone done a fully naked podcast? It must exist, right? Um, or like one of those YouTube shows where you have again, because if you if you if you film from the upper body from you know from your waist upwards or like I am, it's the camera's mostly framed around the upper part of my uh shoulders and shit. You can probably get away with just you know, being completely stalkers and I don't want to have any idea and some of you none the wiser. Unless you do that thing in between, uh, unless you do that thing somewhere in between or somewhere in the middle of your podcast where you just get up and go get a glass of water or something. Oh yeah, I forgot something. And you stand up and you forget you're naked. You know, if you can ever forget you're naked and then you go up and go drink a water and everyone sees your bare behind on camera. Yo, yo, yo. I wonder how long that'll take to get flagged because um, I think YouTube metrics I've seen somehow, a lot of people are very, um, a lot of creators are very, worried about or no i'll have it in the front of their mind about how long people are actually watching their videos so they don't look at the views they look at the actual watch time i think watch time dictates a lot of the reasons behind your video creeping up in people's algorithm feeds i think for the most part right yeah the overall watch time so if you're able to like you know cut your video in a certain way people did and then um, you're able to garner people's attention for the entirety of the video that means that your video can get shared more easily but i wonder how how much watch time actual podcast gets because i know for sh i know for me i'm not sure about you guys but i know like for instance like long form podcasts uh, well mine's an hour but anything above an hour and a half probably i'd say is a long form or proper long form podcast like the joe rogan show or joe rogan podcast i tend to watch the clips on youtube via the U joe rogan clips uh youtube channel as opposed to watching a whole video on the joe rogan um, sh um youtube sh channel and this is this is a habit I've been doing for a while, but it's even it's probably increased in frequency ever since Joe Rogan stopped kind of broadcasting live. He hasn't really they, they never really explained why they stopped broadcasting live, but the rumors on the Reddit on the subreddit is that supposedly he got hit with a few copyright strikes, uh, and they might have taken that live um, function away from his account, or he was nervous that if he kept broadcasting live, he'd be more susceptible to copyright strikes from other. Um, content holders or whatever they be or well, co copyright com company i don't know what the fuck that is but yeah regardless i usually tend to watch the clips on the jre side of things and then um that's how i usually get my uh joe rogan information and then there might be some occasions especially if i've got a long working week where i just listen to it solely via the podcast app and again um that's usually kind of you know i fast forward some bits i'm not interested in and go to bits that i want so i wonder i wonder whether or not people would actually spot a bare naked ass in the podcast if they're not watching the whole thing i guess if you're watching one of those um gamer girls right like a nilla 
and Nility and Nility, whether those kind of girls that kind of, you know, purposely wear skimpy clothes online, you might be more susceptible to just sit in front of the camera, sit in front of the screen and watch the entire thing, right? Because you've got a bit of a chub on and you just want to watch this girl move around and talk and stuff and, you know, you have fantasies about marrying her and stuff. So that might be a thing. But I think generally, do people watch the entirety of videos? I don't think so. I know I don't. I tend to stop them just before they end, maybe in a minute, five minutes towards the end and stuff like that. You know, everyone kind of does their thing. And, and I think there's actually a stat, isn't there, somewhere on YouTube where most videos, if you skip the first first, no, the first 10% of videos, you usually get to the main chunk of the content they need to be listened to, which is very true because if you watch this video from the start, you'll know I'm about to get into the topics right about now. <laughs> so you always waste a little bit of time again, just kind of rambling on. But, you know, that's the nature of the platform, man. YouTube, pod, podcasting, all these, you know, avenues of content creation that don't require much effort, that might require, a, you know, they, they're, uh, they're, uh, they're prone to ramblings in the beginning. It's just what it is, nature of the beast. I guess if I was making a more concise, to the point um, video that had a bit more of a production value, you'd want to chop away all these little bits of fluff. But I think the benefit of this is that you get to speak and get to just ramble on, ramble on, ramble on, ramble on, as long as you want. As long as your laptop battery allows you to. Anyway, uh, here we are, Wednesday, middle of the week. For those of you that hate the week um, and you love the weekends, this is your perfect day, right? Or maybe your worst day because you still got another day, as in tomorrow, to kind of get over until you get to Friday. I'm not sure how people usually think about Wednesdays. Again, I don't need to keep saying this, but you know, I don't really think about days like that at all. I think every day is a blessing and a gift. We are lucky to be alive, those of us that are. If you're barely hanging on, you're still lucky. It's just a miracle that we're here all at one time. We're not, you know, uh, tearing each other limb by limb. We're all kind of cooperating this, you know, hegemony of a society, and we all tend to get along regardless of our differences. So, all in all. Uh, the least of my worries is, you know, worrying about what day of the week it is and how soon can I start drinking and all that sort of malarkey. It doesn't matter. If you want to drink on Monday, drink on Monday. If you want to drink on Tuesday, drink on Tuesday. It doesn't need to be all concentrated to one day. And I think, actually, the fact that it's concentrated to one day, the fact that you have only that one day to look forward to or the Saturday to look forward to, because some people hate Sundays because it reminds them of work on, that they have to go back to on a Monday, it probably increases your likelihood of abusing said uh, substances, right? Whether they be alcohol or drugs. You end up abusing them because you don't necessarily have them when you want to have them. You have them on these set days that don't make any sort of sense, right? Um, I guess it's maybe the opposite of a diet. I think diets probably work better that way. I think for me, in personally, I tend to do better on a diet that's structured during the week. So Monday to Friday, I tend to have a pretty standardized way of eating. Like today, I had four eggs, um, spinach, uh, spring onions, um, some kind of protein on the side. So it has a bit of bacon, might be a frankfurt, whatever I, I can find. If not, just eat the eggs when it is. A, a, a large glass, a large mug of coffee. Uh, and that's basically what I have, right? Day in, day out, and then some salad, and then maybe a, a light dinner. And then you on the weekend, you tend to go a bit crazy. Or if you, or sometimes because you, you're so set in my ways of the way I eat during the week, I tend to sometimes carry over to the weekend and don't really have a cheat meal, or maybe I might have a cheat item to eat or something like that. But I think it works better with food. I think maybe with alcohol and drugs, I think there might be an idea that, you know, as a grown up, as an adult, you probably should allow yourself to have a drink or to have a cocktail or to smoke something uh, during the week, so that when it comes to the weekend, you're not absolutely baked out of your mind and not doing anything. Do you know what I mean? I, I, know for, I don't know about you guys, but I know for me, smoking weed in general just leads to me being inactive and not being that productive and not, you know, really utilizing most of my day and it kind of, you know, just spending most of my day in bed and waking up and it's like 7 p.m. and you've just been spent, you know, spent the last seven hours just asleep in your own slumber, sweating your ass off and shit and you wake up with the munchies, you end up eating some terrible food and, you know, the cycle just continues. I think allowing yourself a little joint here and there after a long day of work on a Wednesday or Tuesday, a couple of puffs just to kind of get yourself nice and loose and nice and comfortable and relaxed, watching something on YouTube, reading a book, I don't know, thinking about something you want to do during the week and then sleeping was probably better than just saving it for the weekend. I would I imagine so. I would imagine so. Again, I'm not too sure how people like to do things, but I think that probably is the best way to go about it. And in general as well, I don't know what it says about your life overall that you have to wait for that one day. It kind of a bit, it seems quite depressing, right? That you don't have anything else to look forward to apart from the some some, some random day on the weekend that you're suddenly going to have the best time of your life. It's like, ugh, I don't know about that, man. Not for me, not for me. But again, hey, oh, we all have different ways of going about things. Today's Wednesday, so if you feel like you are having the time of your life, and let me hear you say, yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, this is stupid. Anyway, let's roll on and crack on. There's so much to talk about, so much stuff to get on. Um, just before I crack on, though, I've been talk, I've been listening just recently to the Joe Rogan podcast with Naval Rav Ravatiyakvalala. I you pronounce his surname. Really informative podcast. It's quite nice because I haven't. I've, it's been a while since I've heard a startup person speak. Right, startup people. I've kind of avoided that kind of scene for a while in terms of just you know podcasts and stuff. A few sometimes when you've heard one startup founder or investor or consultant or whatever angel investor, whatever they be called, um, you sometimes think you've heard them all. But sometimes it's nice to hear you know the people that are the apex of angel investing, like the apex of innovation, the apex of thought leading. Uh, when you hear them speak so succinctly and so clearly about certain things that they're worried about, certain things that they're eager to find a new solution for, it really does give you an inspiring, uh, positive uh, view on the world. It might be a bit macabre in some respects, but I think that's fine. I think the idea that you have to remain positive around regarding everything that's happening in the world is a bit stupid. I know I've worked in some companies where, you know, you hear the phrase, oh, uh, stay positive, don't be so negative, right? And it's just annoying because usually it's only said when somebody is uh espousing a dissenting opinion right when they're questioning uh a collective idea or collective belief that's kind of you know festing its way through the company through some rah rah motivational meeting or speech or something right and you just you put your hand up and say oh actually i don't think that's a good idea all of a sudden you're accused of being negative so no i'm just trying to question and trying to get to the truth i'm trying to hack away and trying to find out what is actually going on or trying to maybe just selfishly trying to understand it for myself and maybe through me asking questions other people will also ask questions and that lead to other solutions you don't know right so sometimes, sometimes having a dissentive voice in a group is a good thing because it usually speaks for the majority because usually most people are cowards they don't want to say anything they don't want to the boat they want to pick up their wages go home and look forward to a friday ha! see how i brought that one back um so yeah hearing naval speak so clearly on the jerogan podcast is very entertaining there's also the uh sober october podcast that i've got backed up so a lot of podcasts listening to today again it goes back to saying how often i don't know about you guys but how often are you guys watching stuff like chernobyl it took me like two weeks to watch that shit man on hbo through podcasting, reading, do my own thing. I just have no time to like sit down and watch stuff, binge it. I guess it's a good sign. It means that I'm doing stuff. It means that I'm not pontificating. It means I'm not just idly sitting around watching other people do cool creative things. I'm doing my own cool creative thing. Cool. But I, f I wonder the people that I, I know in my social group, people that I know online who say, maybe they're saying it, but they come across like they're doing cool, interesting things, but they're also taking part and consuming loads of bits of content and culture in general i just don't know how you guys do it man there's just no time in the day to watch everything to do everything and to read everything and whatever to just experience the things that you're trying to experience it's impossible i listed already two things there recording a podcast making dj mixes reading just those three things are already taking up so much of my time that there's little there's literally no time left over for me to watch other things so i tend to listen to audio podcasts or have the youtube video playing in the background whilst i'm doing other things because you know you can multitask doing that sort of stuff but you can't exactly multitask watching chernobyl which is again was an amazing epic, amazing mini series on hbo i recommend you check it out i think it's over now yeah i'd watch the last season just to watch episode the last episode sorry episode five just now really really good series overall i love how they kind of um told the story you know uh laid out what happened in the beginning and then kind of work backwards I know it's, a, it's an old technique. It's done a lot of time in storytelling, but I think that really did a good... It, it really worked out well. It piqued my interest and kind of held me towards the end. The cinematography is just splendid. Um, some of the scoring was really cool as well. Supposedly, they used loads of sounds from actual nuclear power plants to compose the score for the overall series, which is f flipping frightening how good it is. It's really eerie, really scary. Um, the bit where some of the workers are in the water tanks and they have to go and turn them off manually. It's probably one of the most harrowing bits ever where they walk into the darkness. And one by one, their torches start going, start dying, and they hear that little bleeping sound in the background. Wow, 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 wow. How to really enact fear and terror in a scene with minimal, you know, moving parts is just incredible. I absolutely love it, especially in the era now where everyone's trying to do that shock thing and make you jump out your ski. Like that kind of stuff, it really annoys me. But that kind of like slow build up, scare mongering, oh, fear mongering is something that I'm a big fan of. But yeah, what do I know? Anyway, let's get into this. So much to get through, so much to get through. Where do we start? So, uh, yeah, number one, be anti fragile. Um, this is a really strange, um, occurrence has happened over the last few weeks but um if you're familiar with vox there's a guy on vox called carlos maza uh who does these kind of opinion piece kind of video content pieces that he puts out usually uh based around social issues that are going on whether it's abortion 
uh, whether it's political correctness, whether it's freedom of speech, just t- kind of, you know, timely sort of stuff that people are talking about on outraged social media land. And he kind of occupies the left, you know, extremely far left kind of positions on most things. And, you know, um, he kind of comes, set, he kind of butts heads sometimes with the common hell beliefs with, on the right hand side, you know, just the general kind of culture war that's going on at the moment. Um, for the most part, I tend to kind of ignore his content. Um, it's not for me. It's a little bit too uh, lefty for me in my regard. Um, it can sometimes be a bit annoying, you know, people speaking about political issues, social issues all the time anyway, it kind of, it's a bit nauseating once you've heard one person speak about it, on the right or the left anyway, you kind of heard all the arguments in general, so I don't really mind it too much, but I tend to follow Carlos Maza and I tend to follow um, Stephen Crowder just because I like to see the opposing views, right, because they both occupy, you know, the far edges of either side, right, um, Stephen Crowder very much on the right and uh, Carlos Maza really much on the left, right. So it's good to kind of get an idea of it. I know a lot of people do that because I think some people get triggered really easily, but I don't get triggered for the most part. I don't tend to engage in political conversation or argument online or on Twitter or anywhere in general. I tend to leave that stuff uh, um, for offline or I tend to leave that stuff for my own private conversation with family and friends. And even then, I just don't inspire my political opinion. I don't really think I'm in a position to educate or inform anyone in that regard. I think people can do that themselves. But I like to follow it on social media. I think it's cool. I think it's really healthy for the mind to see what these opposing parties or these opposing party um, cheerleaders are saying, how they're framing it, how they view each other, and how they go about trying to con- trying to convince heart, trying to win over hearts and minds, right? Some of them do it in a very haphazard way. Some of them pull on them. Usually, the left usually tries to pull on the emotional heartstrings, and usually the right tries to go by the analytical, stats based side of things, right? Uh, taking heed from the famous Ben Shapiro saying, uh, "Facts don't care about your feelings," right? So everyone's got a different way of doing things. But this has been a very odd occurrence that's happened lately, right? Um, Stephen Crowder has usually has not a lot of good things to say about this Carlos Maza guy, right? Um, he's usually always going, uh, he's usually kind of always kind of poking fun at him, calling him names, you know, just generally being a bit mean. And I think if you've have if you've listened to any pers- any of the kind of political pundits on the right, you'll know that that's kind of what they do, right? From Candace Owens to Car- Charles Kirk or whatever his name is, to Ben Shapiro, to a few other them, to even people like Nick DiPolo, right? They're not the most softly spoken uh kind-hearted uh people when it comes to winning hearts and minds in a political argument i think of, offline talking to them personally i'm pretty sure people get along well with them i'm pretty sure their friends say they're really nice and you know they're very personable people but when it comes to that political sparring they don't really they don't cut any corners they don't they don't uh soften things up they say it as it as it is and they kind of you know they go for the jugular so if you're on the left it's probably hard to kind of you know speak to these kind of people because the language they use just kind of upsets you right it kind of looks sounds like bullying now from the outside looking in i would say Stephen Crowder has probably crossed the line a couple of times and things he said about Carlos Mazza right he's kind of called him some names and insinuated some things that are probably a little bit too they're probably he's probably only saying that because he knows Carlos Mazza is no threat right and this is kind of saying you know in a very uh, kind way I think men, the way that we deal with conflict is the, the idea, the, the kind of the under, uh, the overhanging um, notion that there's a threat in the air because, you know, uh, we can only exchange words for so long and then it kind of turns into violence. That's where, you know, that's, that's a story as old as time. Men have that kind of, you know, think of their heads. I don't think women have that sort of thing, which is probably what leads to more cattiness and backbiting and, and backstabbing in within uh uh, women's uh, social groups in general but you know guys can usually deal with and end that kind of talk quite quickly quite swiftly with forms of violence so i think the fact that steve Carlos doesn't respect him as a man carlos Meza, and probably doesn't feel threatened by him leads him to kind of take some liberties and say some really wild stuff right which is you know again mean but not something that you should be able, you should re- relegate regulate right it's not nice it's something that you'd prefer them not to say but i think if you've seen candace owens go in full full out you know quick speak uh 100 miles an hour panel discussion uh war face she hasn't cut any corners too right she goes for a juggler because i guess on that kind of platform and that kind of uh place you have to kind of go for it you can't really talk you can't really do that whole like you know dragging your speech pattern shit that star people do the silicon valley people do um can't start talking about society you gotta just kind of go with it right so i get it but cast Mazza recently has had enough and he kind of went out on, on his way to kind of tweet uh youtube 
and say that he thinks uh, Stephen Crowder's videos should be taken offline. His channel should be cancelled because he's um, violating their terms of con their terms of the terms of use, right? Because um, he's being mean. And again, I think it's it goes to it, it's a clear indication, if ever there was one, of the dangers of snowflakes, right? The danger of being um, uh, of being fragile, right? Of not being anti fragile, to borrow the term from Nassim Taleb. And um, I don't know, man, how where this goes from now on. So he tweeted just now, Carlos Mazza, because I think he originally tweeted that he wants he added, added YouTube saying that, you know, with it being Pride, Pride, Pride Month and corporations all around the world, you know, espousing LGBTQ values, that they're somehow um, doing a disservice to their LGBTQ collaborators or creators by not silencing or banning voices that are out to harm them in some way, shape or form, which is really crazy to see, right? If someone says something not nasty about your line, they shouldn't be banned forever. That's That's ridiculous, right? But... That's his point of view. That's where he comes from. And now he tweeted up a following update because I think YouTube kind of investigated the issue and basically deemed that, cut, you know, Steve kind of isn't abusing it, isn't kind of breaking any of their laws, isn't kind of coming into violation of their terms of use. And even though Chuck Asmazek went out there to say that he's kind of, you know, has been doxing, not doxing, has been flagging their videos consistently uh, to try and get them removed, that hasn't kind of worked his favour. So he's kind of made a bit of an update tweet, which again speaks to the fragility of his overall position, fragility of his overall mental space and how he kind of conducts himself. I don't know, it's just a bit very, very, very weird way to go about things. I, I don't know if this is the right way to kind of um, get over, if it's not the right way to kind of enact revenge or I don't know how this works because if you're, if you're kind of showing this level of vulnerability to someone on the right, they're only just going to keep going and twisting even further, right? It shows that you're really, really hurt. And it's really getting to you. Even though he doesn't act Steven Crowder, he acts like he doesn't know who he is. Um, he always watches these videos. He's always flagging them. And it's just, yeah, it's a bit weird. But anyway, here's his tweet. He says the following. Um, I don't know what to say. At YouTube has decided not to punish uh, Crowder after he spent about two years harassing me for being gay and Latino, which is, you know, a bit of a reduction of the overall sentiment, but you know, he does refer to himself as a gay Latino on his own video. So to say that, I don't know how you can suddenly get cause offense, get offended with somebody calling something that you call yourself again, but who knows, maybe there's more to it than I know. And the following T says the following, there's a thread, it's a thread, uh, to be crystal clear, YouTube has decided targeting racist and homophobic harassment does not violate its policies against hate speech or harassment. That's an absolute batshit policy that gives bigots free license. Mm. Again, I think he's kind of, uh, what do you call it, uh, pushing the boundaries of bigotry and racism when it comes to Stephen Crowder. Like I said, I just think Stephen Crowder doesn't like him. He doesn't like Stephen Crowder. They both occupy different positions on a political spectrum. It is what it is. Unfortunately, we live in a world now where people just can't coexist, even though when they have polar opposite opinions, which is very strange. I guess there you have to blame the, the social media platforms somewhat. I think the moment Facebook, Instagram, Twitter stepped in and started uh, regulating what is and what is allowed and what isn't allowed, then stop being a utility like the phone lines, right? If you call somebody on the phone and you say some crazy shit, the phone line doesn't shut you down, right? It's the police jobs to do that. Um, so I guess the fact that they stepped in and started re regulating what people can and can't say, they couldn't, they had to pick a side and unfortunately they picked the left. So for someone like Stephen Crowder, if he does get deleted or if your channel does get demonetized, he can... He could. He has what he has more than enough merit to come out there and say that you know, social media platforms are leaning heavily left, right? They favor the left overall because you know most political pundits, even the comedy ones, are mostly left, aren't they? Right? There's not a lot of them. There's not a lot of Republican uh, talk show hosts, really, for the most part, right? Or they are. If they are, they're doing it in secret. So it's a bit strange, I think, that this is a thing that people are now weaponizing in order to take down other people that have opposing opinions but you know i guess that's the nature of social media um the tweet storm continues um if you're an lgbtq lgbt creator at youtube is using you they are trotting you out to convince advertisers that their platform hasn't become a breeding ground for hate speech and bigotry uh they're hoping you'll distract this advertisers away from the monsters they're creating <laughs> this guy's so fragile man imagine being this worried or this preoccupied or this afraid of someone like steven crowder he's just saying nonsense about you online Trying to make it into a comedy sketch. Sometimes it lands, sometimes it doesn't. Most time it doesn't, right? Um, poking fun at your positions and and challenging your ideas. And instead of 
debating him on those ideas or because rebu- uh, he usually he does quite a lot of rebuttals, right? Stephen kind of videos that um, Carlos Mazda does on on Vox. So instead of having a rebuttal that is kind of you know tinged with lace or some kind of comedy too, you could take a lot of things you could take the piss out of Stephen Crowder for loads of things. He just starts crying on social media and on YouTube and t- and trying to get his followers to flag Stephen Crowder videos so they get taken down. It's like come on, man, that's not that's not cool, dude. Come on. And I'm sure Carlos Mazda is a funny dude. I'm sure he's got some quips that he could. Again, maybe he doesn't want to play the mud, but this is this is social media the space that we're in now at the moment, where this is kind of a it's kind of a bit of a free for all. You have to play, and I think he probably would get a lot more respect from both sides of the of the fence if he was able to kind of dismantle Stephen Crowder's arguments with a bit of comedy, right? Like that would be pretty cool to see, I reckon. Um, it continues, and if you're an LGBTQ employee um, working at YouTube, what the fuck are you doing? Um, helping a guy sell socialism is for fags t-shirt which is not it's for figs it's an inside joke that they do but again he doesn't want to listen to that that company isn't your friend it's arming the monsters that we're spent our lives trying to get away from walk out of there what he wasn't able to quit their jobs because of Stephen crowder's videos are being allowed on there what's he gonna do for them what's carlos manza gonna do for his employees that walk out of their jobs uh work uh, working at youtube highly paid jobs right highly lucrative jobs Come on, man. Um, I have spent two years getting targeted by racist, homophobic abuse of, of one of YouTube's star creators. Star creators is probably a bit of a stretch, right? He's only got three million subs. There's a lot of more people out there who have bigger platforms than him. Today, YouTube decided, and he's a, and he's a far right, um, con, con, not far right, well, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a conservative, uh, what do you call it? Talking head or comedian or personal, you know, or pundit, whatever it may be called. There's, no, there's not many of them on YouTube compared to the people on the left, to be honest, too. So to say he's a, a star is a bit, you know, far flung. Today, YouTube decided that none of his, this violated terms of service. Um, I'm sure a lot of these Stephen Crowder videos get demonetized, too. So, again, it's weird to say that. Um, if you're a prominent YouTube LGBTQ creator on, on YouTube, you have an inc- you have an incredible opportunity to raise hell for a company that's been exploiting you for a while now. It's fucking Pride Month. Use your power. Other queer creators are coming to you. So when you keep saying LGBT, is that in the community? Can you, why can't you just say queer? Doesn't queer encompass all of that? Lesbian, gay, bi, trans? Wouldn't they just cre- encompass everyone under the umbrella? Because LGBT is just annoying, isn't it? Just say queer, right? I don't know. Maybe it's not me. At YouTube, uh, finds all the bullies LGBTQ LGBT people try to escape from in high school and gives them the weapons and platforms they need to keep formatting, torment, tormenting us in the adulthood. It's a platform for monsters. Which is again, this is interesting. He says that stuff about high school, right? This kind of goes back to my um, no idea that a lot of people hate Brendan Shaw because he reminds them of a high school bully, right? Um, the issue with the high school thing is that I think if you were in high school. And you were persecuted, tormented, bullied because of your sexual orientation, right? Or because of your opinion, or because of your political views, and you had no way to protect yourself or arm yourself because at that time as well, the you know, you, at that when you when you were that age, you probably didn't have a Ben Shapiro online dismantling arguments left, right, center uh, during live debate shows and stuff like that with these quick quips that you could then copy and say to and kind of repeat ad nauseum in your own schools. You didn't have maybe access to books or in the internet. I don't know. There were things in your way, right? That prevented you from being armed enough to kind of defend yourself. Even physically. Even just like through martial arts and shit, right? But the older you become, I think the the, the lack... I think the older you get in life, the less likely you are to engage in some kind of physical altercation, right? You're more likely to kind of argue ideas out, shout each other down, um, ho- uh, scroll up and sc- ho- um, scream and holler at people, right? So I think what happens when you're older is that really and truly those bullies shouldn't have the, the same kind of influence or shouldn't make you as worried as they did in school because they can't really hurt you unless they live right next to you, right? Which they probably don't. I'm not sure where Steven Crowder or Carl Smazza live, but I'm assuming they don't live that close to each other, right? So you can essentially say as much as you want without ever crossing paths. They both occupy different places within a political spectrum, so they don't, they're not going to share a platform for the most part. These people don't really come out in real life. Steve Okada does sometimes. He does that um, debate me thing at university, which is quite popular, or that change my mind series and stuff that he does. So there's there's unlikely they're going to cross paths. So the idea that, you know, this is reminding him of high school bullies is a bit, again, fragile thinking because you're on the internet. You're protected to some point, to some way, shape, or form. If you don't like what you're saying, just close down, just close your computer. Um, t- log, out, log out of social media. And all of a sudden, Steve Okada doesn't exist, right? Um, that's one way to deal with it. And again, because you're an adult now, you should be able to argue, debate these points of views or your positions qu- 
quite clearly in a part on the public forum because imagine if he did he accepted a debate or was able to do uh, a rebuttal video every time Stephen even every time he did the video to Ricardo did rebuttal he did his rebuttal right and through those rebuttals Stephen Carter's arguments kept getting dismantled right it would it would um, eradicate the value or the potencies of these little jabs that he does in these videos that's what he'll do in general over time people would start uh calling out Crowder for being a bully if he kept going on and on about him being a queer or him being a lispy queer or him being down him being this or latino it would it would ebb, it would kind of chip away of his insults and it would essentially paint Crowder out to be the bully and a bad guy but when Mazda does does this it just makes him seem like the, a whiny baby right who can't take somebody not agreeing with what he's saying and being mean it's like yes yeah, Stephen Crowder's mean yes he's saying things are out of order but is it enough to get him removed from YouTube like really huh. um anyway it continues on and on here um da -da -da -da. it's he's, oh, he's going for ages now. i can't remember let me just finish most of it um it's quite there's a funny bit at the bottom as well i want to get to it's going to get so much worse now youtube has publicly stated that racist and homophobic abuse doesn't violate their anti-gay anti-bullying policies crowder and his allies are going to be em emboldened um, I generally can't imagine what LGBTQ employees at YouTube are doing right now. It's a strange argument, though, isn't it? It's going on as if, like, the entirety of media has been over overrun by right-wing um, conservative figures, and it hasn't. It's the complete opposite. If anything, there's, there is the lack of balance is what's really hurt in the political discourse in most places, right? In the UK, even, with Brexit, right? The moment you dis the moment you enunciate any opinion, the, the, the moment you enunciate an opinion that kind of verges along the lines of, like, you know, maybe Brexit isn't a bad idea, you get immediately grouped into being some kind of fascist or something, right? There is no balance. There is no nuanced opinion. It's all kind of one way or the other, in or out, um, which is strange. And then he, so for someone like him to kind of suddenly start crying foul and start talking about the media being overrun by far-right conservative figures is a bit crazy and is not really in touch with reality for the most part. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Um... Where we've got, well, and I, I don't know the constant poking at YouTube employees that they should leave their jobs. What's he gonna do? Is he gonna hire them at Vox or something? Um, we've all gotten so fucking used to how toxic and shit YouTube is. We still just accept that this is the way things are now, but it does have to be. It's toxic because YouTube let it guess this way. Let biggest and all right creeps shock jocks take over. It's on them. Hmm. Uh, the important thing is YouTube isn't going to listen to cries for help. They don't give a shit about the harm they're doing to queer and marginalized people. You have to raise hell. Use their platform against them. Hold them accountable for the neglect. Raise hell. What does that mean? The beautiful thing about early YouTube was watching queer marginalized people learn how to use their voices to value the power of their testimony. <laughs> These statements just so empty, isn't it? These woke statements. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? To use their voices to value the power of it in testimony. It's like, what? The power of testimony. What happened to, the, what happened to evidence and facts and, and numbers and analysis and what? It's just okay, cool, man. Uh, and for the fu and for fuck's sake, stop agreeing to participate in YouTube's pride and public relations packages. The company's exploiting you for for while arming your abusers. Don't let them use you in the court in the corporate branding bullshit. Okay, fine. He's he voiced his opinion. That's his way. He stands in the in the fight. No problem. The funny thing is, is Colin Moriarty, right? Who's somebody who's I would assume left of center, right? Liberal kind of dude says the following tweet after he's done this whole tweet, tweet storm. I watched one of Crowder's videos about your work and I'll certainly take and I'll certainly taken aback by some of his language. But maybe you should just compete on the market of, with the rest of us and let your ideas do the talking. That would certainly be the most convincing way for you to win, quote unquote, right? Uh seems like uh this is the following is yeah, right? This is this is what he tweeted, right? Uh and then he here's the following. What do, where, where do, where did Steve, where do you where did he post it? Oh, please let me see if I can seems like he tried to manipulate the market. It's upsetting it. Yeah, and he says the following, and then someone tweeted him. Uh, he is competing and creating and creating the market, but now he's being targeted and harassed based on his ideas. And Colin Moriarty replies, seems like he tried to manipulate the market and is upset that it didn't go his way, which is very true. I sympathize with him because he was take, I was taken aback by some of Crowder's verb, uh, verbiage, particularly in his repetition, in his repetition more than uh, one-off jokes. But it's great to have the wide open boundaries for speech, right? And I think there's a there's a because there's a clip of him basically getting blocked, which is really really funny. <laughs> uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I can't find it. But yeah, it's an interesting debate. Um, 
I don't know how people could operate like this. I think in life in general, being this kind of fragile and not kind of you know having any kind of backbone. Not, not I would say backbone, but not having any kind of stump, uh, st- stiffness or toughness to you is a bit strange. But again, maybe I'm weird in this matter. Where where can I where can I see this? He kind of t- he tweeted that basically he got blocked by Carlos Mazza. I think maybe he might have de- deleted it. Maybe. Uh, where is it? Did he delete it? Maybe he deleted it. Yeah, he might have deleted it. Yeah, I think here it is, right? So, so I think here it is. Where is it? So there. So I think after you tweet that, quite a reasonable response, right? Telling him maybe you should try compete with his ideas. Carlos Mazza, because he's a fragile human being, decides to block him because he doesn't agree with his opinion. Like, such a strange way to go about things, right? Um, and then, yeah, it says, okie dokie, then <laughs> blocked. <laughs> Oh, I fucking love so predictable. But yeah, that situation at the moment. Again, it's something that you probably don't need to worry yourself about. It's very it's a very uh, marginal uh conversation or beef on, on social media land. Unless you follow these people, you don't really know what's happening. But it's an interesting place to be, right? People on the left crying and people on the right are having too much influence on things or are being allowed to say what they want. And then people on the left right crying that the left is taking over and there's no uh right leaning voices. No one can win. And the idea of winning too is so bizarre in this political conversations that like winning okay and it's about personal it's not about ideas or policies being pushed forward for the betterment of society it's about their own personal opinion winning at the behest of somebody else it's like okay then mate but again what do i know next up on the list oh these allergies man I need to get some fucking tablets don't i, I need to get some tablets um next on the list uh yeezy world oh this is quite interesting right i saw this thread the other day on kanye west forum uh, Kanye to the to the, to the to the really really interesting very very much inspiring do you remember when uh, Kanye was talking about building schools and all that sort of stuff right it all seems like kind of far-fetched ideas that aren't really going to get fleshed out never going to see a light of day because all we have to see so far are the clothes and the shoes right don't really get anything more from that because the shoes aren't you know they're not um they're not just you know throwaway things because I think you know, whether we like it or not, or whether someone like me who's kind of kind of steered away from listening to what Kanye has to say for the most part, he has influenced quite a lot when it comes to fashion, especially his iterations of the Yeezy so far, that distress, kind of over-dye um, look, baggy look, uh, distress look, the trainers, the simplicity of them, the lack of branding has gone by and kind of um, permeated through other parts, in, other parts of fashion. His influence is far-reaching and we can't deny that. But some of the other kind of uh, more ambitious t- targets or ambitious goals that he's kind of trying to pull out there, we haven't really seen a light of day so far. We've got some kind of inkling of what he's trying to do with that theatre room or is it the theatre space or the cinema in Chicago they're trying to renovate or he said from extension we're going to see maybe some imprint of Yeezy design um, practice being seen shown there we saw obviously um, his um, interior design for his act for their house as a family is pretty interesting too and maybe kind of goes towards leads towards the minimalism aspects of how he designs or how his team designs we've seen some inclination of how he tends to kind of you know uh, decimate his kind of design language throughout the world with the showroom that he has in the book that i saw featured somewhere right i, I forgot who he worked with but the sort of images of the showroom that look fucking beautiful so we've seen some bits and pieces but we haven't really seen anything of any kind of uh, real real interest that will pique us out. but this thread actually did pique my interest because we saw some really interesting things that i think will be interested to see how it kind of works out in the future um it's a thread from the yeezy forum right and basically, this dude found a video of one of the designers who happens to be, I think, Russian, right? I think that's, the, that's what the language is, who works as part of the design team. And he posted an entire video where the guy's kind of going through, I think, he's, or his own portfolio of the work that he's done as work as pertains to working with the Yeezy team. Um, and the, the thread titled here is, is a designer at that working on the Pornhub Awards with, with Kanye has some crazy ideas for Yeezys, right? For Yeezy in general. And it kind of goes through the entirety of the ideas that they were kind of debuting or the things that they're kind of working through and the kind of things that they were doing. Um, one interesting thing is a Yeezy Pyramid Church, which we kind of saw uh, something similar to, oh, it's for 2020, right? But we kind of saw some a similar iteration with his performance at Coachella, which for me was a bit strange, a bit weird coming from the church, seeing them perform in those kind of outfits on the hill, barefooted or with no shoes, sorry, uh, just singing, no preaching, was a bit strange. It kind of felt a bit cultish again but maybe uh, with Kanye being somebody who architects his entire life why wouldn't he think he could architect his own church of to his liking 
and i also have sympathy for the idea that if you're somebody of notoriety a celebrity of some sort maybe going to church or to a public church that everyone else goes to can be a bit of a drain emotionally you're there to kind of escape from the drudgery of everyday life to kind of tap into a higher power to get some kind of inner peace and then you've got people tapping in the shoulder trying to get selfies and autographs and shit and i get it can get annoying very very quickly um so maybe this is the best way to do it again um the idea of it is pretty inspiring pretty cool to see right um i think it goes there, there's a is there, is there a scripture in the bible that says a church you don't need a hall you don't need a roof or a hall it just needs I think what's the definition of a church? Like one, one of what one is it? More than four people is a church, right? Congregating together and praying. That's a basic church. You don't need a, a roof or any walls or anything. And it kind of goes against the notion of mega churches, right? With some of these guys like Crefo Dollar and um, Kenneth Copeland, these kind of people that have mega churches all over the place, right? Who's the dude that didn't let people in during the floods? So it kind of goes against that kind of thing. Obviously, this there is a part of it that's still exclusive. They have security around them when they're doing it. I, I remember Brendan Shaw mentioning his podcast when he runs through the hills. He, he hears them playing and there's security all over the place, kind of keeping um, people out of it. So I guess that's one thing, but I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, I'm still on the fence with that one. Uh, then there's... Um, only one huge table in it, all soft and cozy. In, is that in the church? Huh. Interesting. Entrance structure. Yeah, that's basically it. There's an A, that's Yeezy Star. Dressing room is in the cave, which is very, very interesting, right? Um, got simulators and shit. So these, here's him showing a picture of um, a desert sort of structure with somebody sitting down on a mound. And that's basically what the store is, which is a very interesting way to make a store. Um, again, very experiential, which could probably explain why we haven't seen a Yeezy pop up so far, which has been interesting, right? He's kind of stay with pop, which kind of goes to against the Kanye basically design ethos, kind of going against whatever the whatever the common notion, whatever the, the popular notion is, you'll kind of stay away from it and try and do his own thing. So the idea of having a pop-up or a temporary space in the conventional way that it's done is maybe a bit cringe to him. But I like this experiential kind of nature of uh, this store. It looks very interesting too. The floor plans look very, very cool. Um Again, everything is built into the actual um, structure. So there's a kind of a bike, uh, a fitness bike that's kind of built out of the sand that you would see for the desert. That you can kind of use and kind of maybe test out your shoes. A easy re restaurant where the dishes are served on your lap. You sit down on the mound instead of being sitting on a table. So again, um, it takes away from the, it kind of democratizes um floor plans of restaurants right because some places are more lucrative than others where you sit uh there might be an idea that you know you don't need to have any reservations you can rock up and sit next to a banker next to a celebrity next to a single mum. that kind of aspect of it it's quite communal as well in that way shape or form that's pretty cool um there is a where was that um there's a span is it is it a scandinavian there's a scandinavian restaurant that does that similarly right where they all kind of sit around an open fire. I don't know what it was. A restaurant does something similar. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that that was really cool. Another slide on that one. The, here's a slide of the actual tray with a little hole in the middle of it, which is quite interesting. I guess that's the bit where you put your let your lap on, and maybe the food sits in the inside and in the outside. Going to great, which is interesting, right? He's t basically taking uh, the food tray, something that was much be bemoaned as being the that's being the thing that broke down society, right? Remember there was a time where people were saying that, oh, you need to sit around a table and get back to family values and stuff. And now Kanye West is trying to basically redesign an item that was at first kind of something that, you know, people would say would be a, a marker that society is crumbling, right? That we're not kind of sharing and uh, eating ar around each other and trying to make it, it's it's more of a separate and a, a bring it together. And maybe this food tray kind of does both things, right? Because you can move around and sit where you want. I'm interested to see where that goes. One second. These allergies are killing me. Um, it continues on here a bit. You've got a Yeezy scooter. With wheels got made out of the same rubber from the 350s, which looks very interesting. Scooters are something that I've kind of slowly but surely come around to. Um... I'm not a fan of the scooters that people ride to the stations, right? Uh, to kind of gain an extra five minutes of sleep. I think there was a quite pathetic. See people like racing down the street with their scooters, riding them. Has anyone ever, have, you, have you ever seen someone fall on one of them scooters that they ride to the station with? That would be so hilarious, isn't it? Because in the morning, you're definitely not in any kind of shape or form to fall, out, fall over, right? You just about woke up. You've got, uh, you know, some coffee in you. 
you're struggling to kind of step, keep your eyes open, you're dreading getting into work, and then imagine you're on your scooter hurtling down the street and you fucking stack, man. You're going to feel that. That shit's going to wake you the hell up, isn't it? So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that. But I'm kind of getting around to the idea of the electric, the, the, uh, the electric scooters, right? The ones that Bird do. Um, there's a few other companies that are doing them now. I think the, the company that Case Nice that rides the skateboards of, electric skateboards, they've made one. I saw a, a guy, uh, I saw Sam Sheriff, uh, reviewing one of those kind of uh, actual scooters the other day actually looked really really cool so i'm, I'm actually getting around to the idea whether or not i'll actually use one for my day-to-day commute i'm not too sure if you look a bit a bit of a dork wearing riding those kind of things i just think of like a startup bro with his little macbook air at the back of his backpack right listening to some nondescript podcast like you know i don't know i don't know where, where, where i stand a bit but again a cool idea again income all encompassing the easy world right you can imagine some of these easy employees riding those things in between um, offices so that's pretty cool right without buttons and stuff electronics is managed intuitively feels like a living creature so what i guess intuitively like a hoverboard right a hoverboard doesn't really have any controls you kind of lean forward lean backwards to stop and stuff so that might be something that quite would work pretty well in that regard um and do some most i think electric scooters have a throttle right on the handlebar right you just hold like a motorbike i'm assuming isn't it or maybe a button, because maybe holding it that all the way through might hurt your wrist. So maybe there's a button that you kind of hold, and then a button to kind of, yeah, maybe I'm not sure how that works, but that's pretty cool. Um, this is probably the most interesting one, and maybe the one that's going to split opinion is the Yeezy Sound Buds. So on this slide, you've got a, basically an image of these earbuds that look a little bit similar to um, uh, um, noise cancellation earbuds, the ones that you might use if you're working in a factory or you might use if you need to sleep and stuff, right? So they're orange tipped and they've got a connect a cable that links both of them on either side. And the uh, text, I think, translated from the actual presentation was that uh, without buttons and any manageable elements, broadcasters only Yeezy sounds, so only stuff that's, you know, within their kind of label, or which, I mean, which means maybe Yeezy's developing an imprint under Yeezy sounds that isn't good music. Good music is maybe an entirely different thing that Pusha T would manage and would be a little bit more traditional, a little bit more um, easy to categorize in that respect and maybe Yeezy will be a bit more experimental so you might see stuff that we might have heard on Yeezus being deployed because you you could imagine an Aphex Twin or somebody of that kind of like of that kind of ilk releasing something under Yeezy as opposed to good music right good music is probably more in the vein of traditional hip-hop in that regard still pushing the boundaries but more e easier to classify whereas Yeezus kind of sounds like nothing else probably one of my favorite albums of Kanye and maybe my the favorite time period of Kanye too he was going he was on his full anarchist mode right fuck everything burning the whole thing down and trying to flip tables right and change things and it kind of led to where he is now at the moment now he's a bit too woke and a little bit too um, I don't know, I, I don't know. Um, he's a bit too, I don't know, he's just in a weird place for me at the moment, but I, I like the idea of this, I think it's interesting, I think it might, and again, um, sorry, it says, it only broadcasts easy sound stuff, uh, yay once all the time, and podcasts for four hours, okay, one week of noise, why not, so he will, they'll program what they want into the actual broadcast, and that's what everyone listens to collectively, which is interesting, because it goes back to, there's a time, there's a period in time, when OVO Radio was at its pomp, when can't, Drake was really, really dominating, he's still dominating. No, but the period of time where I used to tune in live to hear the OVO sound uh, radio mixes because you're, you'd want to hear uh, an exclusive, right? From Drake, an exclusive from somebody under the, under the OVO camp. Or somebody that's related to them, right? A lot of the UK guys will send them dub plates. Some of the other US people over uh, over time would send them exclusives too because they knew there'd be a large catchment area, people that uh, catchment audience that want to hear that sort of thing. And it kind of got me thinking, you know what? Radio could work if the show was good enough, if it had enough of a pull, if people trusted the person speaking enough. Because nowadays, I think radio doesn't work because for the most part, you have people with a huge ins inflated sense of self, right? The Paul Rosenbergs, the Ebros and stuff who really think that their opinion has any kind of weight when it doesn't. They have a program director that sits above them that dictates exactly what gets played. So you end up with the station that plays the same five or ten songs again and again and again. And DJs who have probably seen much better days, right, in terms of the funk flex and stuff. So there's no real authority. There's no real trust um, on their end in terms of their programming, which is why probably a station like Beats One is where we come in and really smashed it because they've got people in that people trust right they've kind of grabbed them from the outside gave them a show and for the most part people like soul selection people like that are really smashing it on that kind of station and people listen to those two hour and a half um mixes of you know new jazz and uh new uh, neo soul and stuff really slow easy ambient kind of music that really you know would get boring 
quickly but people listen to it so there might be an aspect of it that would work i know i mentioned before but the joe rogan podcast when that was live i would stop everything and actually listen to it live in london which you know is quite late at night depending on what time they start in la sometimes it could be 11 p.m and i just kind of just watch it live in the background as i'm doing other things before i go to bed so it's not that far-fetched to imagine other companies doing the same thing spotify deciding to make their own headsets that broadcast certain stations or playlists on their thing certain labels um imprints of a label might do that you might be able to get an, an, an atlantic pair of headsets a 300 pair of headsets maybe excel rec- recordings might do something similar and stream some of their artists who people kind of love excel have done a good job doing it because they've, they've cultivated the roster a very um carefully hand-picked hand-selected artists right there might be an opportunity for you imagine like a jay paul who just announced he's putting out new music he might decide to stream his album um exclusively only to people that have the excel recording headsets right uh, on only for a particular set of time or even album listening parties which i think are really odd where people stand around and just sit in front of the artist as he kind of dances to his new album that you have no context for what about having the ability to have a a, a a global experience where everyone can partake in this kind of feedback loop in terms of what you like about the and what you don't about like or just a, a global listening session right that'd be pretty amazing um and maybe for just artists in general they can maybe tap into influencers they can't exactly fly over send them a pack of the headphones and tell them to tune in at a particular set of time and give them their thoughts and opinions on what they like and don't like about their music or get the influencer to stream it on their instagram profile there's so many things to do with that but i think that's probably the most interesting thing i've seen so far in these slides um and then coming on we've got yeezy headphones re-engineered for a new feeling of sound music gone make you cry so i'm assuming they've got sensors that basically tap into some kind of neural pathway on your brain somewhere um which again will be very very interesting you know how freaky it is when you're listening to a song and it kind of plays a one instrument plays at level percent from the red it really gives you a, a sense of atmosphere and feeling and warmth especially with shitty headphones so that might be something that might work out really good we have a easy home pod here which looks amazing it's like free tubular uh uh cylinders kind of like uh, linked to each other so if you're familiar with the beats kind of tubular um portable speakers whatever they may be called or bluetooth speakers you that kind of looks similar to that you kind of link together which is really interesting because i use my bluetooth speaker all the time if you've been to stratford and hanged out the station you'll see lots of kids using their bluetooth speakers to play music and stuff so it's something that a lot of people like and yeah in general a really interesting video um i'll link it and show it for you to check out it's all in russian unfortunately so you're not going to be able to understand it unless you speak the language but um a really good presentation by the dude who's a, a, a designer there going through some of the things that they kind of are trying to do as you can hear there you go strap russian there loads of things on there i think he linked all of it hasn't it? is there anything else on there that i missed out Put it up here, you know? yeah yeah i think that might be it anyway i think that might be it so um i recommend you check that out use your sound um designer talking in public about the stuff that they're planning to do something very rare something i'm sure a lot of people haven't been able to see but i think these are projects we're probably going to see in the next coming years and might explain why we're getting the Kanye we're getting now at the moment <laughs> i think so anyway in my opinion humbly humbly in my opinion i think that might be the case um what else is happening here actually let me move this to, to aggregate sound let me take away this I'm not too sure if the sound if this is even gonna save actually because I'm not sure how much I've done here already beforehand. But I need to delete some things here prior. Bear with me one second. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm getting you know I get a message where it says your storage disk is full. And last time I continued making a video without stopping, it kind of fucked up and you know it kind of corrupted my whole real hard drive. And I don't want it to happen again. Please, if you don't mind. So I'm gonna try and get rid of some of these things first before I do anything else going forward. And hopefully that helps to free up some room on the old laptop of the Lee. I'm not gonna watch that anyway, so I might as well remove this as well. So many stuff to remove at the time. You always download stuff thinking you're going to watch certain things, but then when it comes around to it, you're like, meh, you know what? We'll not watch. Do this thing, remove all files, go here. You're probably going to hear the bin sound in a minute. Empty the trash. Boom. Let me go, let me go here about this Mac and see how much storage space I've got before we continue. Just don't want to get in any kind of trouble. Please, if you don't mind, if you don't mind. Hmm. Still downloading story. That's interesting. I've still got that much left on there, right? Four only. Let's get rid of this as well, then. Maybe this too. That. 
and that. How much room have I got here? Oh, not that much left, isn't it? Bamba routed. Okay, cool. You know what? Just in case this deletes, it might be a good time to end it now and then maybe come back around on the other side just in case things don't work out because, again, I don't want it to get... Because last time I did this and I continued on, it just completely corrupted my entire drive and I don't want that to happen again if you don't mind. Please, thank you. Jesus. Um, where is it, bro? Da, 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 da. Nothing else happening there, right? I don't know. Hmm, interesting. Interesting about this mac yeah only four gigabytes left so i think that might be a good place to maybe end actually let me see if i can get the other one here let down delete this as well hopefully this works out now and going forward this should be fine now going forward i'm hoping so i'm going to stick with it right just need to kind of go through a couple more things here um let's not end there let's keep on going ba 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 what else do we want here um easy one to talk about oh virtual soco loco this is quite interesting right um da, 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 da. so virtual played at soco loco i'm pretty sure you guys are aware of it because I've, I've spoken about it a couple of times before i think but mainly because of the dj equipment he was using he had a specially commissioned pioneer uh cdj 2000 nexuses i think and a djm 900 or something along those lines that were made up to be translucent with no logo, no branding, no text, no nothing on any of the buttons or any of the equipment. If you know anything about CDJs or if you've DJed those kind of equipment, you'll know that over time, once you get used to playing on CDJs and on a Pioneer mixer, you get used to the things and the functions that you like to use more often than not, right? So you don't you don't need to like know what the button does or says. You just kind of know what kind of works out pre program for you. I'm imagining if you're a virtual, if you're a top DJ, you usually have a rider that specifies the equipment that you need to use, the kind of settings they need to be on for you then to have a good set because there's no time to kind of waste to kind of faff around changing the buttons or putting the cables in the right place and stuff, right? I know that probably is the case. So um, this, but this kind of set, this DJ set or the, the kind of equipment just looked amazing. It looks like something that I would love to see in the stores. I'm not sure if they are going to release them. CDJs in general from Pioneer are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly expensive as it is. Um, so much so that most DJs like myself usually buy controllers and in practice with that kind of stuff home and then hopefully over time the more you get booked in places which anytime you get to play on cdjs in my experience or anytime i get to play on cdjs when i get booked in a nightclub or in a bar you get to kind of practice your kind of you know work that you've kind of done in the last few months at home and stuff so um again maybe something that might be out of reach for most people but i think you know uh, pioneer have made white cdjs before right all white ones which weren't that popular i don't really, don't really see them in, in clubs at all you might see in people's personal collections but i don't really see clubs really having those they always have the standard black uh, sets but i'd love to see these in clubs i think in a club like fabric in a club like xoyo no no fabric probably the best one because you can actually see the dj a little bit um uh xoy i'm not sure about the new setting maybe you can maybe the new one um corsica studios maybe is a good one where you can actually see what the dj is doing like on the table and stuff that might be a good way to go about because especially with the lights maybe fold might be a little bit a good way as well because fold has got a little thing that kind of covers the dj booth i think for the glare but if you could actually see the decks and see the actual players it would be quite cool to have in a nightclub having those lights does LEDs light up uh, with all the other lights you have to, in your club? I think it would look really cool. But in general, I think it's actually a good a good motive, a good idea just to kind of play a bit of the video because um, a very influential uh, techno electronic based YouTube channel called Fry909, who I've kind of followed for years. I think some of the most legendary videos that I've watched, I kind of got me in love with electronic music from the video of Richie Horton playing on the top of that hotel rooftop party and his vinyl skipping, but him still being a boss, Ricardo Bello Low Boss, the famous Magda I Love Parade video, loads of kind of staple kind of videos in the techno electronic scene. Um, Fra 909 has been kind of behind it and he kind of took a video and he's always there um, around kind of the key seasons especially IB for all the key parties I'm pretty sure he's kind of familiar or friendly with some of the promoters and they allow him kind of unparalleled access really in the DJ booth some weeks so quite rare a circle local and IB probably not because there's always scores of hangers on hanging around in the DJ booth but for, for, for uh, more likely than not it's still kind of an amazing job that he does uh, being able to have that kind of level of access to the DJs that he's had access to and he filmed a little video of Virgil playing and there's not much indication you can tell of whether or not he's good or not or whether or not he's doing a good job or what it may be called but i just love the idea thinking about it of a kid watching this now it's kind of like you know how i'm, I'm obsessed with hiroshi fujiwara i think you know 
Um, Hiroshi Josh Fujiwara and Aaron Bond are off probably the two most foremost people in my head, and maybe James Jebby and Nigo, who kind of really framed um, the way that I kind of view my position within streetwear and within culture and how much influence I would like to garner or I would like to gain. Um, over the next few years with the projects that I do and the idea of being a creator, the idea of not just being a consumer or the idea of trying to be an active consumer, somebody is trying to kind of pick away at things that you're buying, really question your buying choices and when you find something and when you can't find something that kind of uh, suits your needs, instead of complaining and whining on the internet, make your own version of it, right? That's essentially where, that's essentially the birth of streetwear, right? Um, James Jebbia coming up and kind of, an, and even um, Sean Stussy prior to him, right? Uh, deciding that he wanted to, make a uh, surfwear a particular way because he didn't like the stuff that was on the market at the, at the moment that was a bit naff that was a bit trite and then coming out with your own brand in, t- in order to kind of carve your own lane of the market I think that's kind of the best way to go about things right the complaining and the whining about stuff isn't really the best way in my opinion so um it's quite cool to see Virgil doing what he's doing with the DJing the fact that he's challenging himself and putting himself in these weird uncompromising uncom- positions um in a position where he's surrounded by people who are 10 15 years in the game martinez brothers are young but they've been djing since they were like what six years old or some shit seth trucks has been in and around music his whole life he's come from a long line of musical uh family right i think his parents both played the instruments or in bands he's down down at a record shop or something like that really really people that have real strong histories in music and electronic space playing in Circa Local, which is a very unforgiving crowd, right? Um, people that just want to see bangers and big name DJs. To put himself in that, in harm's way is something that kind of really does re- give, you have to give him a lot of respect for. And I think over time, we've kind of seen an improvement because I think, again, with his celebrity or with his name, I think there is a part of it that is mostly based around, you know, him being able to attract a certain crowd. But I think over time, that kind of, that kind of stuff loses its value and then your skills become something that's of major importance and I think the fact that he's able to kind of go in there because I think I saw I saw some pictures of some Circo Loco off-white merch which again is a really great tie-in so the fact that he's able to go in there provide them with merch provide them with some very varying level of clout they probably don't need it right because they've, they've got a long history anyway they probably have people that go to Circo Loco regardless of the line up and they book it year in year out but you know he's able to give them some added merch some added clout in the fashion game bring in a whole different audience and just provide another flavor of what you're going to play which is what i always say about female djs it's not that you just need parity on the lineup what you want is that you want the lineup to reflect the audience right so sometimes just having a woman on stage brings a different kind of feel and, and vibe to the overall room and sometimes just having the same kind of male voices or even female voices can sometimes make it a bit naff so that kind of democratization of the djing or maybe inviting new people is something that's very much i'm a fan of and i just think for the kid out there watching this video for the first time and seeing virgil play at circle Loco, it must be super super inspiring man i reckon so i know for me if i if i was a kid and i was a fan of the stuff that he'd done i'd be like wow you could just you could, the amount of stuff that you can do he's kind of you know head of louis vuitton menswear Got, has his own brand, collaborates with loads of other friends, creates capital collections, under capital collections, designs shoes, DJs, blah, 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 lectures, has an art exhibition coming up. It's amazing to see, man. Seth Chocolate here, giving a bit of a hug behind the booth. Again, it's hard to tell if he's doing a good job because the crowd is completely dead. A circle Loco, this one, this one they're playing at. Some people are shooting and tolerant, but no one's saying anything. Everyone's just kind of like standing there watching. But it's hard to tell, isn't it, with um, DJs on YouTube. I think it's hard to tell, I think, in some cases. I think if you watch a Boiler Room, recently I watched one with a festival in Belfast or Dublin, AVA Festival. Wow. Like, that crowd goes nuts. But again, like, it's Dublin, it's Ireland. Those kids probably don't get to see those kind of artists that often unless they're playing in a particular nightclub down the street. So to see that many electronic DJs or big DJs playing in one space at one time, all the kids come out and just about, they want to rave because, again, they don't get that many boiler rooms either. They want to show out for the camera. But that was fun. But these kind of videos, you can't really tell because these are all experienced ravers that go out all the time. But one thing's for certain, those decks look sick. Sick, sick, sick. A translucent mixer and CDJ is like, wow. But yeah, Virgil's going for it, man. He's going for it. And he's dancing too, which is cool to see. I'm not just being stiff on the decks. But yeah, I love it, man. I love the look at the decks. How interesting that would look. There you are know, some screams I can hear, which is standard. Yeah, 
Yeah, but yeah, it looks quite cool. It looks good, man. You can't again. You can't really tell too much about this. So it's hard to judge. I think um, watching DJs on YouTube is similar to that quote about dancing into art- architecture, right? It's just I don't know, man. It's hard. I think you need context. I think once you've been to a boiler room, once you've been to a circo loco, then you watch a video. It kind of brings it to life more so than just watching it like this. It just feels a bit. It feels a bit naff. It feels a bit try hardy. Um, not try hard. It just feels a bit naff, right? I don't know because you're not there. You can't really get can't really get with it i think once you've been to one you kind of see it i think from what it is but again as a, again as a set i just i just visually just look at it. it's fucking awesome i love it and just little things once again right he's wearing a bright neon orange long sleeve t-shirt and playing with translucent tdjs right just goes against everything that you'd see most electronic djs wearing right rick owens um you know hide it no rick owens and angelus and all that sort of stuff like black all black basically black 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 cdj everything is black but to see some bit of life, some bit of colour in it is something that I like anyway in general. But yeah, it looks cool, man. It's pretty cool. He's playing in the Ibiza circuit and all that malarkey. So yeah, interesting. I looked at the video for you in the show notes for you guys listening via YouTube. You can check it out for your own self. But yeah, it's fairly fairly interesting to see the uh, Virgil in that kind of space actually, because again, you wouldn't you wouldn't have thought that when you first started DJing, innit? it? Was, it didn't look too promising. But again, as you see, as you see, the more t- often you do something, the more you're put in these uncompromised positions where you have nothing to do. You have nothing else. There's nothing else to do but try and get better because you're in su- you're in the room of so many killers, right? You don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want to let anyone down. You want to give a good account of yourself. You're representing a scene too. There's loads of things that's tied into it. So he's kind of his learning curve is like fucking. You know I mean, he's learning super super quickly. And and again, we're seeing the fruits of it because the bookings that he's getting now are even more uh, frequent than they were before. Even though he's kind of his his workflow or his busyness levels are even more than what they were prior to him kind of kind of taking his DJ stuff even seriously than it was before. So yeah, credit to the guy, man. He's doing some good work. Um, what else I want to talk about? I think that might be it, you know? Yeah, I think let's end it there. Let's end it there because I'm not sure if the video is going to load up properly or the audio. Hopefully it does. But this is Jack and Zinger Show, episode number 204. Thank you so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have the pleasure of your ears today. I'll be seeing you guys again tomorrow for the episode of the show. We're already three days in, three days in a row. One more to come on Thursday, maybe one more on Friday. But if you want more information regarding myself, DJ gigs, contact listings, or else malarkey, go to my website in the link below, xnozinger.com. If you want to leave a comment on the YouTube page, leave a like like or subscribe feel free to do that and i'll get back to you with the comments especially um let me know what you think and if you listen via the audio leave me a five star review so people find my podcast but before but apart from that or before that but apart from that thanks again for tuning in and i'll see you guys again very very soon peace out